briefly from people who came up with some good ideas. So, my dad's a total world. Yes. Uh, Put the microphone close to your mouth. From our discussion, all members of trade unions should persuade their unions to publish a simple leaflet and circulate an email message explaining to their members why to oppose TTIP and to tell their members of parliament to oppose TTIP. There is already excellent literature from the Green Party, WDM, War on Want. The text is already there. It just needs to be put out in the name of major trade unions to their members. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. So, if you haven't noticed, it, Kids are, they're hanging up on the, on the string here now. Let's have a little cheer for the, the kids' art group. Yay! Woo! We have to keep it really short. Okay, fantastic. So, I've just got some other very quick report backs and then we'll move on to the final speaker. So, I'll be very brief. I think the um, thing that came out of our discussion was that this. Um, is in a way a free poll campaign. There's the political side, there's the writing to MPs, calling them out if they agree with TTIP, um, asking for their support, asking them to get involved if they don't agree with it. There's the media side of it, there's the pushing um, on social media and trying to get the issue raised in the mainstream media more, writing articles, sharing the resources the resources that we've already got on the TTIP website. But I think to me most importantly is the community organisation side of it. It's going home, it's going back into tenants organisations, political groups, single issue groups and raising the importance of this so that next time we have a demo, um, when we have a demo and the people that can make it come out into the streets, they're not, it's not just them, it's representing um, a general mood of public opinion, escalation of critical mass, that's the point we want to get to by, by September, October when the national and the international mobilisations start happening. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, and I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name's Chris, and uh, we have four ideas to put on the table for you. And Miriam, wherever you are, Miriam, wherever you are, listen to this one as well. The first one is, use the power of the support that we have to, to help facilitate meetings between our campaign leaders and European Union commissioners, similar to what 38 Degrees did on Thursday evening with Vince Cable. Very good show there. The second thing to go and do is to borrow from the very disliked heritage organisation, Miriam, this is one for you, whose tactics in bringing down and changing opinion are brilliant and we should learn from them and use their techniques against us. The third thing is, is one of the group members suggested analyse what caused the governments to not go ahead with action in Syria, see how that was done. And the fourth one is to encourage community actions up and down the country throughout Europe to go and help people realise this is an underground issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is just one sentence. Please try and find out who your MEP is and talk to them about this issue. They want our votes. Make sure that they represent our interests. Hey, we were just, all we said was just like, instead of uh, writing template letters, go and see your MEP or MP if you can, if they have surgeries. Look them in the eye and make them feel why it's terrible, why it's going to be, and also it's a withdrawal of power from them, as much as it's a withdrawal of power from us. So, um, we, they should be defending their democratic right to be involved in the process as well, as much as we should be. Uh, make them feel that. Okay. So, we do, however, have one MEP who we don't need to go somewhere to see because she's here today. She's about TTIP. She's a long-standing Green MEP for London. Uh, the Greens are opposing TTIP. Let's hear it now for Jean Lambert. Firstly, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I think it's really amazing to actually have this organised in London, elsewhere throughout the UK, and it's really, really important for the movement as a whole. And as people have been saying, there is an absolute need to shine some light on this proposed agreement and to oppose TTIP. As you just heard, the Greens in the European Parliament voted against the negotiating mandate from TTIP when it was produced. It opposed the opening of negotiations at all. We've set up a website called ttip2014.eu to provide information from the Parliament end 
We're not alone in that. Lots of organisations are doing that, and that's really great because you get a variety of information. But we leak documents as others have. We've challenged the lack of transparency and challenged the assumption that more trade is automatically a good thing. And we want to open up this process. Next Tuesday, Tuesday coming, the new European Parliament is actually going to be debating TTIP ahead of the sixth round of negotiations. And you can watch that live. You may prefer to watch paint dry. There's that going on. But there's going to be no written resolution to sum up the debate. And why is that? Well, that's because the four main political groups in the European Parliament have decided that they don't actually want to take a position on this publicly now. And I think that's a real shame, because then you'd be able to measure the effects of your campaigning during the election and on into the new Parliament. People have been saying the proposed agreement is huge. It's the biggest bilateral trade deal ever negotiated, and it's going to cover more than 40% of current global GDP. So, you know, it has huge implications beyond the negotiating partners. That some of the big losers in this are actually going to be developing nations. Countries in North Africa, for example, where you know, some of their economies are quite reliant on exports to the European Union, they're set, according to some figures, to see a drop in real per capita income of anything between about 3 and 4 percent, and that's a lot when you don't have much to start with. And that under some of the scenarios, for example, countries like Mexico will also be affected, with a drop of about 7 percent. So this is big stuff. And that even within the EU, that there are estimates that trade between certain countries could drop by as much as 40%. So you've got to ask, how is that going to fit with tackling youth unemployment? Where does this fit with all the optimistic stuff that we're hearing about job creation out of this? And this is one of the main reasons that you will hear from the Socialist and Democrat group in the European Parliament, that for them, they really think that there are going to be jobs coming from this. Well, dream on. Yeah. And even if there are, it doesn't mean that those jobs are necessarily going to be where you want them. It doesn't mean that they're going to be decent jobs. And, you know, we really need to wise up on the job aspect. That there's no, you know, guarantee whatsoever on that. We know that, you know, we'll be hearing from the US about some of the concerns there about local contract requirements. But the EU, we've got people here who are also really worried about the fact, the fact that EU companies will not be treated on an equal basis with companies from outside the European Union. A lot of people, I'm sure, have been talking about the um, state investor dispute settlement yeah. being included. Well, it's not a new mechanism. It's around. We can see what it's actually been doing here in terms of um, your chill factor on changes in the health service, on some of the positive restructuring in the health service as opposed to most of it. Now, we know that because our health service has gradually been opened up to competition since Thatcher's time and that successive governments, we've been hearing that it's going to be much more difficult for any government that wants to actually move back to a more public, you know, non-competitive, just dealing with the needs health service. You know, the Health and, health and Social Care Act is a disaster. We've got a tough enough job trying to reverse that without having it locked in through teaching. The European Commission, you know, they're telling us that uh, health services are not going to be affected. Well, how do they know? They're not willing to exempt health care services and other social services explicitly from this agreement. And we know there's a whole set of ways in which once you've got the door open, you can really kick it open and move it in there. But there are health risks in the wider sense as well. And as again, we've been hearing they come in the way of neutralizing um, regulation, of doing this, well, you know, if your regulation, if it's legal for you, we'll make it legal for us, um, and then we'll harmonize later on at some sort of standard, which will probably be much lower. And this is really undermining years of hard work to put in place strong legislation that aims to protect public health, animal welfare, health of the environment, health and safety at work, whatever. 
which are increasingly seen as barriers to trade, or as Cameron describes it, green crap. On chemicals regulation, you know, a lot of you here will have campaigned on REACH, the EU legislation on that, on pesticides regulation. We've got competent sources within the Commission who are saying to us that the EU has nothing to win from TTIP on chemicals and has everything to lose. Because the US is not signed up to international agreements. We've also been hearing you know, from Via Campesina, from others, about the effect that it's likely to have on animal welfare and on food, on pesticide residues, on, you know, what's permissible in terms of whether you chlorine wash your chicken to actually make that acceptable. We've been hearing about the risks on pharmaceuticals and the possibility that, you know, worst case scenario, this undermines global standards, this undermines the ability of the WHO to actually bring in decent deals on pharmaceuticals. So how is it actually going to improve our lives and the lives of others to reduce protections like this? It doesn't. And it's another reason why TTIP is extremely dangerous. But it fits with the political choice, of course, that deregulation is a good thing. So if it goes through, there are going to be fewer choices to be made in the public and the democratic sphere. So as it's framed now, TTIP's an abdication of political decision making and a promotion of corporate decision making. And governments need to wise up to that. Otherwise, a lot of their talk, as Mark was saying on sovereignty, is absolutely hollow because they are giving up the right to decide, giving up the right to govern. So we need to be using all the tools that are available to us. And we're already making a difference. You know, we've seen the Commission rushing to try and make things a little bit more public. We've got the advisory body. You know, we've got stuff like this going on. They are running scared, and so are a lot of heads of government. Who yeah. actually want to try and push this through, through faster because they can see the way in which opposition is growing. So the opposition also has to grow fast as well, which is why October is important. And governments have a choice, you know, there's a choice to be made here. It's about whether we're actually having a future that's working for corporations, or whether it's a future that's working for the general public, for the common good, and within that political parties have to make a choice. We've made our choice, it's why the Greens are here today. Thank you. to an activist and academic who's written widely about anti-globalisation movements, about the history of debt and many other things. Please welcome David Gray. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm here because I'm a veteran of, of the global justice movement. By the way, not the anti-globalisation movement, that was the media. Uh, we weren't anti-globalisation at all. Um, in fact, the whole point of, of the global justice movement, or we just call it the globalization movement, is, uh, is this better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, about like that. Not used to it. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the whole... Uh, what we thought the whole point of it was is that, that what they call globalization has nothing to do with globalization. Globalization means the free movement of people, it means the free movement of, of, of things, but it also means the free movement of ideas. Um, they were against all of that. Um, but I think what, looking back at the global justice movement, um, I think that this moment is really historic because if we defeat TTIP, it will be an ultimate victory of the global justice movement. This is an act of desperation on their part because they've been routed for most of the world. And we don't realize here, we, these are historic events. Events like this make an enormous difference. We go around a lot of the time thinking of ourselves as, as weak, as, 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 as ineffective. But mobilizations like this change history. And I've seen it happen time and time again. Um, when we started the global justice movement, people thought we were lunatics. Uh, everybody in the press, there was a thing called the Washington Consensus, everyone called us a bunch of flat earthers, a bunch of crazed reactionaries wanting to go back to uh, 
you know, back to the 1950s, um, who had no idea of the inevitable march of history. Um, anybody who doubted any of this free trade orthodoxy at the time was literally treated as insane. Within a year and a half, just about every single one of those newspapers, magazines, basically collapsed and said, okay, you guys were right. Yay! Yay! In, in uh, two years, we managed to sink every single global trade pact they tried. Um, first it was the MAI, then they tried the Free Trade of the Americas Act. Um, they had a summit of the Americas in Quebec City, ended in three days of massive street battles, at the end of which the entire thing collapsed. The WTO in Seattle, the trade talks collapsed, they haven't been able to revive them since. That was 1999. Um, the WTO has basically still been um, unable to advance their agenda since then. These things work. Um, and the reason why is because it, what they do only works if there's, they can convince us that it's inevitable and there's nothing we can do. The moment any number of people wake up, the moment people start hearing about what's going on, the entire thing falls apart. And they know that. They're terrified of this. Hence the panic reaction we saw in Seattle and Quebec in Genoa, where the um, police brought out tear gas, water cannons, like vicious attacks against people. They only do that sort of thing because they're desperate, because they know that um, the moment these things become public, it becomes impossible. I want The reason why they're doing this, this is a treaty which affects America and the EU. And I think that's historically significant, uh, because essentially these guys have been kicked out of most of the rest of the world. This is what people don't understand. Uh, the Global Justice Movement was an amazing movement because it brought together people from every corner of the planet. Uh, there were indigenous movements, tra trade unionists, uh, every sort of political collective or an organization from farmers in Karnataka, landless peasants in Brazil, fisher people in Malaysia. Um, within, within two years, these people had managed to kick the IMF out of most of the of the Earth's surface. I have been the scourge of the planet. Uh, structural adjustment policies and, and devastated economies destroyed the lives of millions of people. Uh, destroyed education, destroyed health, uh, destroyed food security for people all over the world. Within two or three years of mobilization, groups like um, Via Campesina, groups like People's Global Action, united these alliances across the world, and essentially brought things to such a pass where the IMF had been entirely kicked out of East Asia. Uh, to this day, those guys, they can't operate there. Yeah. Uh, they've been entirely kicked out of Latin America. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, three or four years ago, or five, four or five years ago, they're practically on the verge of bankruptcy themselves because everybody hated them so much. Right. Uh, the moment you start getting people to exposing what these guys are up to, you can, you can rouse them out. You can destroy them. And We've done this before and we can do this again, do it again. And the reason why that they're doing it to us, it, it, it's really, I think, more than anything else, we're looking at imperial collapse. Now, you used to be able to inflict these policies on everyone in the world. People in the world rose up. Uh, people in the world cast them out of uh, East Asia. They cast them out of Latin America. They aren't talking about austerity in those countries anymore. They're talking about austerity here because it's collapsing back to where it started. Because you know, the techniques that they employed to the rest of the world, first with colonialism and then the economic colonialism that followed it, they developed that here on ordinary people in countries like England. That's what, that was the laboratory for imperialism. That's interesting. Um, that was the laboratory for imperialism. And now that the people in the world are rising up and kicking them out, They've got nothing left to bring it back home and bring and do it to us. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we can stop them, and we will. I mean, just because we're standing at the at the brink of a new historical epoch. The neoliberal model has collapsed. Uh, it's been completely ineffective over and over again. It's failed even in its own measures of increasing economic growth. Uh, and even the people in the ruling class understand that at a certain point. There's a, there's a kind of whiff of desperation in what they're doing. They only have one trick. They play it over and over and over again. It doesn't work. They just try again. They try again. They try again. It, it looks like they're at the brink. After 2008, after people's eyes are opened. Um, and people understand what they're up to. They know that the moment this is exposed, it's going to collapse. And then people are going to say, all right, if that model doesn't work, what model, what model is there? They spent 30 years trying to convince ourselves that there's no possible other model except this one thing, and they keep trying over and over and over again that never works. So this is it. When this one collapses, they're going to have to start looking for something else, and it's people like us who are going to provide it. Yeah.
David, you know, we've been talking a lot today about the problem of TTIP being about uh, the EU ending up with the lower standards that are in effect in the US in a whole series of areas. Uh, but you know, US citizens are going to lose out as a result of TTIP as well. And the good news is that many of them know that and they're mobilising against it. So I'm really pleased to introduce now our final speaker. Melinda St. Louis is the International Director of Public Citizen, which has been at the forefront of fighting TTIP in the US. Please give her a big hand. Thank you. 
to be able to for corporate power and to allow them to um, to get their corporate wish list that they cannot get in our democracies. And so that's why it's incredibly important for us to be mobilizing together in the U.S. We have a broad coalition of trade unions, family farmers, faith groups, environmental groups, consumer groups that have come together under the Citizens Trade Campaign. We have made sure that President Obama does not have authority to negotiate these agreements. He is freelancing, folks. He is out there without authority from the Congress that has the constitutional authority to negotiate to over trade policy. And we are making sure that will not happen. Three-fourths of his own party in the House of Representatives have said no to fast track, which means that they do not have the authority to do this. The Republicans, many of them, also don't support this. So we are doing our best. It's going to be very hard because we know the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Business Europe, this is one of their top priorities. They are throwing millions, if not billions of dollars in lobbying to this, but we have the people power, and as we've heard over and over, we have beat this back. We beat back the multilateral agreement on investment. We beat back the, the free trade area of the Americas. We beat back the Doha route of the WTO, and this, and we're going to beat this one too because. We have all of the arguments, we have all the data on our side. When we talk to them, they really don't even have a leg to stand on, even at the technical level. And so many of us are going to be going to Brussels next week. They're going to be in, in Brussels trying to negotiate the sixth round of this negotiation. We're going to be go through all of their official stakeholder events and, try, and make the arguments. But what needs to happen is that at the local level and in the national parliaments, we need to be raising this debate and making sure that they know that they cannot cross these critical lines of people power and people sovereignty that they're trying to do through the TTIP. So I'm thrilled to be able to, to be here, and I'm thrilled to see this campaign growing in, in the UK. And we want to work transatlantically with you all because this is the corporations versus the people. It's not um, the U.S. versus Europe, etc. We know that um, who who are the real enemies here, and we know how to how to stop them because we've done it before. So, hands off public services. Hands off public services. Hands off our democracy. Hands off our sovereignty. want it back, sorry. We want to make sure it goes on the next protest and the next until we've defeated this agreement. So, please come and bring it over here and leave it to where, where Vika's waving. You've got a bow hand, bring it back to us. Okay. The next thing is, don't forget the 2nd of August, if you want to get involved, we're going to turn this protest, we can beat this agreement, but we need a movement.